Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Forrest Gregg. I'm a PhD student in sociology. Uh, we're going to be going over uh, a number of, going to be, what we're going to cover today is going to be a number of scripts uh, that, and a lot of present, a lot of material. And it's actually, all this stuff is already on GitHub. All the code that we're going to be looking at today is available for download and along with a kind of extensive uh, read me about what we're doing. So if you uh, get lost today and you have another opportunity and if you want you can check that out and you, you have any troubles working through that, you get in touch with me. So we got more than one shot here. Okay, so uh, web scraping is ultimately about collecting data and the first thing that we have to think about when we're collecting data is why are we collecting the data? Uh, so the, we're going to be using a kind of an example here of, let's say that for some reason we're interested in uh, kind of consumer spending in Chicago uh, over an aggregate and over time and we'd also like to know something about not just the total amount of spending uh, but uh, the kind of differences in spending, in uh, uh, spending on different kinds of things over time, shifting patterns of consumption. So, if typically, if you would be interested in a question like that, you might go to the uh, National Consumer Expenditure Survey. But unfortunately, that really wouldn't tell you that much about Chicago. It turns out that the Department of Revenue for the state of Illinois uh, actually publishes very uh, fine-grained information by municipality of, uh, of their sales tax revenue. And you don't have to make terrible assumptions to think that sales tax revenue is an indicator, at least at aggregate, of, a certain, of, of certain segments of retail consumption. Unfortunately, the data is only available through this web form. So go here and let's see, look at, let's just take a look at Chicago. Doo -doo -doo. Doo -doo -doo. It's already hard to use. Chicago. Now the state is actually pretty rich, right? So because they're, they're basically what they're doing is they're uh, classifying the retailers based upon an industrial code and then they're, then they've made a set of the Department of Revenue has made a set of bins to aggregate those into 10 types and you get totals. And then all these d different columns are the different kinds of taxes that we pay in Chicago. There's lots of different taxes, lots of people. There's lots of independent taxing bodies. Um, but the, and also what's, very, what's also very interesting is they actually give you the number of taxpayers here. The number of taxpayers is actually the number of retailers who collect sales tax. So I mean that in itself is Pretty, pretty interesting information. So this is great. Um, we can, we can, if we can get all this data, we might be able to actually uh, do something interesting with it. But this is a good place to actually stop. Really, you know, if, you were, if you were doing a real project, this would be a great place to stop and to think about this question: like, what would you do if you actually had all the data already? You know, is like. Because it can, you can get kind of into this stuff and it can be kind of gee whiz neat to kind of feel like you're getting lots and lots of data and at the end of the day you have lots and lots of data and you don't have lots and lots of questions. Uh, and before you kind of go down this rabbit hole, you should always kind of like really imagine about, okay, well, imagine I already, ha already had the data and if you can't come up with a compelling question that lets you, like, like you can now answer or you can imagine answering, then you should move on quickly. The next question though is if you decide that, yeah, I really want this data, is, is that like, I'm, can, can you just ask for it? A lot of times, the simplest way to get data that you see on a website is to find out whose website it is and just ask them to send it to you. Particularly someone like this. If I was actually doing this project, I think you'd be much better served in contacting the Department of Revenue and asking them directly for the data. Um, sometimes that's not possible, but it's, you should always at least consider whether that's an option. It's gonna, oftentimes will save you a lot of time. Okay, well, let's just assume that it's not going to work. The third question is, is that is it actually legal for me to scrape this data? So many websites um, have what's called a terms of service, which is, a, which, is a, which is language that describes what they want you to do and what they don't want you to do on their website. 
Uh, and you don't have to read it, let alone explicitly agree to it for it to be, uh, for, for your consent to be considered, for, for it to be considered that you have given your consent. If you use a website and you break the terms of service, you can be sued. And it's up to you to proactively look for the terms of service and see whether uh, scraping is prohibited. So uh, Google's, uh, Google's terms of service says, quote, don't misuse our services. For example, don't interfere with our services or try to access them using a method other than the interface and instructions that we provide. Uh, so that, uh, that like basically what we're going to be doing with this site is writing a different interface to their data. And that's exactly what Google is saying don't do. And if you do it, you're, 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 you're in violation of a contract. Uh, and it's also, you know, it's not nice. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Uh, so let's go back here. And let's take a look at what's going on in this address bar, in this URL. So compare this to this. So a lot of it's the same, right? The first part is the same, but then there's all this kind of stuff after uh, specific, right? That's not, that's not in that earlier page. So what this stuff is, is a request. There is a computer program somewhere in the Department of Revenue's website that is saying that where you're, where we're, we send this URL to them, and it's basically saying, please send us the resource that corresponds to a request that has this set of parameters. The parameters are the, the name of the parameter is the, is the, the what's b before the equal sign, and the value of the parameter is what's after the equal sign. So we have a parameter P, we have a parameter M, we have a parameter C, T, X, and why. Now, I don't know what any of these things are, but I know that they're parameters, and I know that that's how the request is being made. So the first thing that I usually do at this point is I'm like, well, do I actually need all of these parameters? Because if I can figure out, if there are ones that I don't need, they can really simplify my task. So let's just try getting rid of these X and Ys. Oh, it gives us the same page. Let's keep going. Oops. So it looks like now we have R, P, and M, and we got all the, it's giving us the exact same page. Let's see if we go back one more. No. So we need the M. The M is somehow important. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit because it also ends up we don't need the R. But we need the P and we need the M. Okay. So let's, now let's look at this value of the P for a second. And this is the kind of thinking that you kind of need to be able to do sometimes when you're doing web scraping. Uh, it's 20122. Well, and the reporting period is 2012 second quarter. So maybe what's going on here is, is that the P is the reporting period. <laughs> so we change, maybe we change this. Uh, let's, hope, let's hope that it, that gives us, what, the, the second quarter of 2011 for Chicago. And it does. Right? So that's cool. Can we do it like a third? Let's see if we can do it the third quarter. Well, now we're in a really good shape, right? Because now, we, now we've kind of figured out a pattern that will allow us to grab every period for the city of Chicago. Uh, but let's look at this M thing. Well, what happens? We get two. Arlington Heights, OK. Uh, but I don't know. So that's another number. So, that, so this is suggesting that the M actually really is something to do with uh, the municipality. But a mapping between these two. I have no idea how that's working right now. And we'll, I'll, we'll figure out how in a second, but all right. So but like basically, we now have a way of, for at least for the city of Chicago, where we know the right, where we know the right M code, 
to, to programmatically go step through every single uh, reporting period because we figured out the period pattern. Um, so let's say that we actually now have, you know, we're back. We have, so for it, imagine that we already have that pattern. The thing is that we got this, we got this information, but it, we need to actually extract it and so that we can then turn it into another format that we can use, like a common delimited file, or maybe we'd want to stuff it into a database. But this format is really still not usable for a, for a, you know, for further for further analysis. So the uh, so what we're going to have to so let's just so we have to take a step back and we have to think about what is happening when you contact a website when you make. So we figured out in some ways how to make a request to a website, and what comes back. And what comes back usually is a big blob of text called uh, HTML. Uh, and the browser does magical stuff with it, but it's just text. And we can look at this blob of, of text by, like, if you're looking at a website, you're looking at this website, and if you've got a two-button mouse, you, know, you can uh, right-click on it, and use page source. If you've got a Mac, you can do command click, and you can do the same thing. And you get this, you know, kind of abstruse-looking text document, but it's just text. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be able to. So and all the information is in here, right? So this is skipping this bit part right now. This is long, right? Here are some of the same numbers that we saw on the other page. Right? So um, if we can figure out how the, this is organized, then we can write a little program to extract just the information that we want. All right, so I'm going to take a little, in order to do that, I need to say a couple things about HTML. All right, so uh, HTML is a mixture of, of, of kind of text or content and descriptions about how, or directions about how to lay out that text or content. Um, and so if the content, if it's, a, if it's the way that you describe something is you put it in tags, a tag is, is some text with that it's within angle brackets, like this is a tag, and this is a tag, and this is a tag. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that many of these tags come in Actually, all these tags come in pairs. Um, so, like, so if you wanted to write, oh, let me just check this out. So, if you wanted to write a, this is a this is a paragraph tag, and you know, all this is one paragraph. Uh, so that is a, so so that's all one element. That's all that like the the start and start and close and ending ending tag, I'll put that together, and that becomes kind of, that we can conceive of this as having a, this document as having a, a hierarchy, right, that everything is a child of HTML, right, so head is a child of HTML, and title is a child of head, and a grandchild of HTML, uh, and actually this is bad, this is not valid, body. And body is a, is a sibling of head and a child of HTML, and P is a child of body, a child of HTML. You know, I mean, it seems a little bit abstruse about the kind of talking about children and stuff, but uh, why this is important because if because we can represent this document as a hierarchy, it means that we can uniquely refer to every single element in a document, which is going to become very important in a few minutes. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that this 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 is kind of covering a lot of stuff and are really kind of a lot of different stuff lightly. But in some ways, web scraping kind of requires that you know a little bit about how uh, the internet works and a little bit about how documents are laid out, and a little you know, and it's oftentimes helpful to know a little bit about um, how databases are set up. Okay, so. Oh, the other thing that does, that's important to know about uh, HTML is, is that these tags can oftentimes have options. So, like, we wanted to put in a link here, return turn. 
So it's going to make this word paragraph into a link that points to google.com and this uh, a tag now has this argument href which stands for hypertext reference that, that, tells, it, that tells, us, tells the browser to make this link point to google.com. Let's take a look, say this and take a look at this, all right, so. And I'll, yeah, right, so. Um, okay, great, so now we're gonna go back to the source, right? The source of this thing that we're trying to scrape. And what we're trying to find when the kind of, what we typically are trying to, what we wanna do when we're, when we're kind of parsing uh, a results page is to try to find something distinctive about uh, the elements that are around, well, the parts of the page that we really care about, which in this case is these numbers. And so one thing that we can notice is that they're wrapped, that they're enclosed in these TD tags, right? So there's a start tag here and an end tag there. And that this TD tag has these options on it. It's got a class called data, and it's got a line right, real line top. All right. So now, I'm going to do some interesting magic. All right, so. Okay, now we're going to write, we're going to write, start writing our first script here. So this is in Python, but basically every kind of higher level scripting language like Ruby or Perl, you know, or C, if you want to go to, to use that, uh, has equivalent libraries and methods that do almost exactly the same thing. So URL lib2 is a library that comes in the, is in the standard, uh, the standard part of the, is in the standard library for Python that gives methods for uh, opening and interacting with, uh, with web resources. And beautiful soup is a very nice um, library for parsing HTML uh, files. So this is right. So this is the address. You may see we got our P here. This is what we're going to be requesting here. Is hopefully the uh, tax information from the first quarter of 2012 for the city of Chicago. And so that's our URL. And we say URL open the address. And then once we have that open, we 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 say like we'll just read it out into a, a string called response, and that would give us the same, if we said print response there, it would give us the same thing that we saw in view source, the exact same thing. But we're not gonna do that, we're gonna, we're gonna make this into a beautiful soup object, uh, which has a bunch of really nice facilities. So this is, if you remember, this is, this is what we wanna grab, right? This is, we wanna, we wanna find all the parts in this document that kind of fit this pattern. Uh, and right here, a line right, a line, we have a line, we have taxes, soup fetch, and that's basically saying, give us all the, T, the TD elements that have those options in the TD tag, all right? And then, uh, then put them all in, like, and this thing is gonna like, find all of them and put them into a big array, a okay, big list. And then we're gonna go through that list and you're just gonna print them out, and so let's see if we we're able to do that. Yay, we were. So, so see, these are just, just, the, just the TD parts that we were asking for. It looks like it, right? So that's, that's great. We're already making a lot of progress. We've, you know, we've basically ignored, now ignoring everything that we don't care about so far. But uh, this is still not something that you could really this is still too much of a string. This has too much HTML into it. All we want to know is uh, what's the number, or if there wasn't a number, is it blank? So we're gonna go to the next step and just build a little bit onto this file. All right, so all this is the same. And now, okay, so remember I was talking about the hierarchy before? So, so the, what this is saying is, is that give me the second child of the TD tag. Uh, one thing that's strange about Python is that it's zero indexed. 
So if I wanted the first element, I'd have to say, give me the zeroth element. element. And the second element is the first element. And that's just different languages do that differently. In Python, uh, the, the, because it's zeroth index, this is actually asking for the second element. And then it's saying, and that second element is actually this, is going to be the center element. And then I'm asking for it to just give me, if there's any text, that is, if there's anything that's not a tag, just give me that. Because I want to get the um, I want to get the name of the text. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is is that like I'm actually going to go a little bit backwards or not backwards, but do things a little bit differently and say like, well, okay, I'm going to now treat this this thing not as this beautiful soup object, but just as this long string. And Python, like many modern scripting languages, has a lot of very nice facilities for manipulating strings. So the first thing that we're going to do is Interesting. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through, basically do a search and replace for this BR st string, you know, and so that's going to get rid of all of those, and then we're also going to get rid of this last TD thing, and then we're also going to get rid of any commas if they exist. All right. Actually, I'm going to put a print statement here and just take a look at that. Uh, yeah. So see, it looks a lot like uh, the output that we just had, except that it it replaced, uh, it removed a lot of these BRs and these TDs and got rid of the commas. But it's still this string. It's a little hard to see that, but trust me, it's a string. And so now we're in a good place where we're like, okay, well, let's now uh, there's a every time there's a new line, we're gonna split. We're gonna say, oh, that's a different element, and we're gonna make a we're gonna turn that into a, an array. So like a, just a list of those elements. We we'll do that with uh, this split command. Other languages have almost the exact same kind of thing to do there. It's saying so every time you see this new line uh, character, then everything before that becomes a new element. And then we are going to ignore the first two elements because actually, and then we get this, and then we're going to take a look at it and see if we got what we wanted. OK, great. So this is really cool, right? So, you know, this is actually we're at this point now pretty much done, right? Is is that we have the name of the tax, and then we have this big list of numbers uh, that corresponds, if you remember, to that list of numbers. Just might be good to remember. Corresponds to the different kind of sectors, the industrial sectors, right? So, um, then. Uh, but one difficulty that we can identify is, is that the same tax type is appearing more than once. And that's because in Cook County, and for Chicago, there's a little bit of Chicago that's in DuPage County over by O'Hare. And the way that this website works is, is that it breaks those out into different sets of results. And so we need to figure out how to handle that because we're not, right now, we're not handling that. And we'd also like to grab the number of taxpayers. All right, so then the next step is, OK, this part is the same, the top, right? OK, so now this part is getting, ooh, yeah, this part is now getting, OK, actually, let's go back to this source. So uh, we'd like to now, this part you're going it, to, it is the case, although you would, this, it's, it's actually hard to see it, that the, those different, table, those county Results are actually uh, in distinct table elements within the document. And it's, uh, it's very hard to see it here uh, because of the formatting of the way that the, the source. So actually, one thing that Beautiful Soup does for you that's very nice is, is that they will, um, uh, is that it will, it will, it will beautify the, uh, Results, right? So this is this. This is just the source, but see now it does this nice formatting for you, and it actually makes it much easier to see the hierarchy of the document. So if we go down, it's going to be blah blah blah. It makes you realize that there's lots of stuff in a document that you never see. All right, here we go. 
All right. This, this is that the different results are, are in these tables that have this option here. Order zero, cell, pad, cell padding zero, cell spacing three. So that gives us another thing to grab, and that's exactly what we're going to do here, right? So here, for tables, cell spacing three. As it ends up, the other arguments don't, are not identifying, it's just a cell spacing three. However, one thing that's a little bit unfortunate is that there's one table at the beginning that also has that cell spacing three, so we need to ignore that, which is what we do by saying, we're just, for the table in table starting with the second table. And again, because now we have this hierarchy, then we, now we can grab this, now we can grab the uh, TD elements just like we did before, right? But now, we're, but it's only going to grab the elements that are the child of the right table. And this part is exactly what we saw before. And this is just a little code uh, that's similar in spirit to what we saw before that's grabbing out that header information. Um, and let's see if it works. Okay, great. So, a, uh, so we have, so this is the due page, this is the due page stuff, right? And then these are all the taxes for the due page. And we're in good shape. So, actually, we have now completely extracted all the information that we want from this one page. And then, well, so like, now the only thing is, now the only thing to do is to go back and iterate through all the pages that we want and, and run this code for every page. So I'm gonna go back to the source for a second and return back to these like P and M, which seemed like it was a little bit magical how I knew that. Um, and you don't have to, you don't have to be as wise as me. You <laughs> can look at the source. Right, so here we, at the top of this code we have this, we, we see this form method here, this form uh, tag. And then we see this select thing and it has a name of P, right? That P is the same P that we saw before. And then there are a bunch of options that are children of, of that select tag. And those options, right, they look, you know, they look, they have these values. And that value is the parameter that we're giving it, right? So if you, if you didn't guess it, then if you looked at the source, you could say, oh, well, uh, looking at this, the value of, of 2012 first quarter is 2012-1. Uh, and this is good. We can also learn some other stuff from he here. We can see the range, right? So the earliest stuff is 1994. We can also see that um, if it's index, if the last digit is zero, then that's not a quarter, but it's a, but it's a, but it's for an entire year, right? So, and we can also see that the quarters begin here, 1999 with the third quarter. So, and then also similarly for the uh, similarly for the um, municipalities, now we have a place where we can look up the municipal code for each, for each county. And this is typically where you would kind of find this kind of stuff. Okie doke. Uh, sure, you got a question? Yeah, I, so, um, is it, isn't it like the case that having um, like those sorts of forms written out that clearly is very much the exception? No, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, the thing is, is that if there's a form, and then it then the then it had it has to be in the HTML. If there's a, something for you to select, it has to be in the HTML source. Well, it can be like attached to the HTML, you know, and then you may not have access to the action. Right. So there, uh, so there are kind of two main ways of making requests to web pages. The first is doing what this website is doing, which is encoding that request into the URL. And if that's the case, then it's then it is almost always this easy. Yeah, it's always it's pretty much always this easy. But if it's there's another method which is where you uh, where you can make requests that are not within the are not within the URL. It's a, through what's called the message body, and uh, many modern websites do lots of that. Particularly more things that have a lot of AJAX or things that are kind of much more interactive and kind of newer and flashier. It can be very hard to, uh, it can be, there's a lot of, it's kind of tricky how to do that. I think it's a little bit maybe, and uh, we can maybe talk later about ways of doing that. But yeah, so sometimes it's, this one, I chose this particular website because it's actually a pretty easy example. Okay. So now let's put it all together. 
and uh, all right. So these are just the this this uh, these column names, right? Are just the I just knew that from I remember that from before is, is that we're gonna we're gonna basically build a common delimited file, and these are the headers for it. You know that we're gonna first we have the municipality, then the county, number of taxpayers, the tax type, the year, the quarter and then the industrial classification, general merchandise, food, et cetera. And then this part, this part is basically about uh, outputting something usable. It's not actually, I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of a separate thing than scraping because you could have many inpu in inputs, but this is saying like we're gonna, basic, we're gonna start writing a CSV file in the first row, that, the first row we wanted to write is these column names. Okay, now this is where it all happens, right? So we have year for range in 1999 through 2013. So that's gonna, so we're gonna iterate through every year. So first 1999, then 2000, then 2001, et cetera. And then we're also gonna iterate through every quarter one through four. You know, it's a little bit of, again, uh, a little nuance of Python that in order to get through one through four, you need to say range one through five because it doesn't ever get to the last element. And then we're building this URL or, uh, dynamically, right? So we have this base part, right, which is uh, the, and then we're saying we're going to take that base part and then add on to it the period, which is just going to be the year and the quarter smashed together. And then we're only going to do it for Chicago and have that be, and that's what we're doing there. And then, then this part is exactly what we saw in the last script. Um, Okay, the only, and there's only, so then we grab all this information and then we're gonna, then we're gonna write all of that information into a CSV file. Uh, and, you know, this part's not all that interesting. Uh, so here is one thing that's very good to do. Uh, it's, if you're, if particularly if you're pulling down a lot of data, it can be a very burdensome on the servers that you're on, uh, of the website. Because you're making a bunch of requests really fast, and you're making a lot of them, and it can actually cause <laughs> it can cause some real problems. So uh, it's always a very good practice to say between requests to just pause for some certain amount of time. It's a nice thing to do. It also, if you do it, it's much less likely that someone's going to block you. So it's even it's it's, it's, an, it's, it's the enlightened self-interest thing to do. Um, five seconds is usually what I do. Uh, you can do, but uh, it's uh, it, it's, it's always a very good idea to pause between requests. Okay, so let's do it. Okay, so this is great. So that one doesn't actually exist and the script just kind of automatically worked in an unexpected way. By usually I would have expected it to crash and burn, but it didn't. Um, so remember, we looked at before 1993 is the first one that it is, and we get the these are the 1999 third quarter results, and then it's thinking 1994 fourth quarter results. It's writing all of these to a CSV file, and I'm going to jump ahead. Well, I'm going to let that run for a second, and um, you know, so like I mean, basically this all works and you have the results and then like, well, so what? <laughs> so, I mean, so, the, so what is, not, is a question outside the scope of this presentation? Hopefully you had a reason for scraping this data in the first place that now you can, now you have the data, you can do something with it. Just because you guys have been patient, you know. And so one thing that you can, this data is actually, and this data is actually kind of interesting, is, is that one thing you can do is you can just like, well, there was, in this period there was a big economic recession, so like how did that affect stuff, right? So this is the, you take the data and you graph it over time, and you know you can see like, oh man, there was a big dip in 2008, isn't that? And then another thing interesting is that you have the number of taxpayers, right? And then you look who are retailers, right? You're like, wow, that like so like that's kind of interesting. Is is that like the the total volume of taxable sales seems to have recovered, but the number of retailers, note the scale on the y scale on this thing, but it's still like is. You know, it looks like a big drop, and it is a big drop, but it's also doesn't go all the way to zero. But the number of retailers hasn't um, hasn't recovered in the same way. So those are the kind. Of, I mean, so like you know, I mean, 
I can't promise you that you'll have interesting results if you do web scraping, right? Like a lot of times the answer will, will not be, but I just wanted to show that to you because this data actually has a lot of interest in it. So is this thing done yet? Uh, no, but I'm going to kill it anyway. So uh, let's take a look at taxes.csv, right? Ah, it's a wonderful, wonderful, familiar, should be familiar a CSV file, right? Where we have a header and then we have, just as I promised, the first row is the municipality, I mean the first column is the municipality, the second column is uh, the, the, the county, uh, the number of taxpayers, the type of the tax, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so that is, all right, so it can go, like this is a start, right? This is kind of like, this, this is the basic framework of thinking about like, what web scraping is, is about like, figuring out how to, in a programmatic way, make all the re requests to get all the resources that you want, and then extracting the data that you want from the resources. And we did this example here on a website that was actually much easier to scrape than most websites. Um, uh, and uh, Misha was bringing up a great point that a lot of websites don't have this nice URL. They, like, they don't encode the request in the URL, they encode it in post form. Um, so one thing that can make that your life a little bit easier for that sometimes is a nice package called Mechanize, um, which basically to some extent can uh, simulate a browser. It can, like, it can track cookies, if it can track some level of state, but it can't do JavaScript, which a lot of the newer, a lot of more modern websites require in order to have real interaction. But this is how we would submit a form using the Mechanize library. First we create a browser object, and then we, this is kind of interesting, but I won't get into it. And then we say we open a URL, and then the, the base page, and then we say like the form that is called query one, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna set the p value to to the, to 2012.1 and the n value to 16.01, and then we're gonna submit the form, and we're gonna get a response back, and the response is gonna be exactly what we were getting before. And so this this library is actually sometimes very useful, but really when you get into um, doing a lot of websites, you have to actually spend a lot of time kind of reverse engineering exactly what's going on, and for that there are a couple of tools that are invaluable. Um, uh, yeah, which I get into here a little bit. So, uh, so post requests are the kind of that I'm talking about where it's not in the URL. Uh, if you're going to be dealing with a website with that, then something like Firebug, on it, if you're using Firefox or Chrome developer tools, kind of are tools that let you kind of trace all the requests and the headers that come back and forth, and you really need something like that. Um, another great resource is Scraper Wiki, which is a repository of scraping scripts that people have written, and you can get a lot of inspiration and ide like ideas about how to handle certain kinds of patterns of interaction. Also, this works because particularly larger corporations, they tend to not, they tend to oftentimes buy solutions, and so their patterns of interactions are oftentimes quite common, and so you can find, often on Scraper Wiki, Wiki you can find a scraper that's not necessarily for your exact organization, but is for, but for an organization that used uh, a use a solution that is the same solution that that your target is using, so that it's so you don't so that you can modify it pretty quickly and get get going. And if you're really interested in this and you need some kind of like you really need some more practical help, then I the only really way to kind of learn this is by working on it and talking to people who have done it a fair amount. Uh, and I would suggest like in Chicago, the resource is the Open Gov Hack Night, which happens every Tuesday at 1871. And there's mainly kind of op like developers and open data activists, and most of those people have written lots of scripts and can help you uh, work through any kind of particular problems that you have. And it's very fun and welcoming community. So that's it. That's all I got. You got any questions? Yeah, I got two for you. Uh, first is suppose you wanted to retrieve uh, sales taxes from every municipality. Uh, in a particular time period uh, throughout the state of Illinois. It looked like there was a seven-digit municipality string, and short of being Rachel from Card Services and iterating over every single bloody number, uh, some most of which are not there, right? I mean, they're not 10 million yeah, totally. municipalities. How would you do it? Well, so I think that would actually be a great exercise. I, I mean, I know for a great exercise for people who are interested in this to actually to try to do that. And I would, 
the, what, what I would point to is, is that you would ha in this HTML code, we have a set of relationships here between municipality codes and municipality names. So I would think about, well, how would I go about extracting this list into a format that now I can iterate over? Because this is, this is the complete, this is not necessarily the complete list of all municipalities, although I, I think it is, but it is a complete list of municipalities that you can access information for on this website. So I would, what I would do is think about, well, how can I get this list out? And how can, and then once I have that list out, then it's be pretty easy to modify This for loop, right? So instead of instead of having this having um, the m be constant, that's just something that I I'm now iterating over all the options for that. Uh, I mean, it's akin to the problems that uh, you would have to deal with the random digit dialing. So uh, ten digits in random digit dialing. The first three for your area code come from a confined list. The next three would be for the exchanges and those are not uh, deterministic for each area code. Uh, you might have to purchase the list for those. And then the last four digits, so 10,000 numbers right. uh, to cover, um, there's nothing deterministic about them. And for the waksberg mctoskey method, for example, right. for using this, what they would do is they would hit uh, a selected subsample of those and find out whether that subsample was in fact valid. Uh, and regard that as, tag that as being a useful cluster and then uh, keep track of it. Uh, are there resources that you would point people towards here for identifying uh, right. subsets like the equivalents to area code or exchanges or the yeah. like that simplify their search? Well, in this case, like I'm saying, you, you don't, for this particular, you don't need to do that because the complete enumeration of all valid IDs are in the HTML code. But Sometimes it's the case that you do need to make guesses, and then it just depends upon the search space. A lot of times, when, you, when you're in a place where you do need to make guesses, um, it's because they're trying to make it not so easy, and, op and, that's, and, then, and they often make the search space enormous. And so then you have to think a little bit more creatively. So for example, I have a script here. Um, where I've been scraping, I, I have a scrape of all the legislation uh, on from the city's uh, from the from the city's legis legislation site, right? So like all this from all the legislations that in the history of it that's been passed since 2010. Um, but this is a little bit tricky because um, because first of all, the site is very slow. <laughs> Uh, but also because these, because the detail pages where all the information is, like have this crazy, this part's not that bad, right? But, but this is a 32 digit hash, right? Like you need to know both of those and there's no way that you, if you, like you can't explore that space. Um, like, and, and in, like within, so, but what you can do on this site is Search for nothing. And wait. Uh, I mean, this is one reason why I scraped it. This <laughs> is too slow. Um, right. Is to, it, you get all, to, all of the records are in, are, are, you can walk this list here and get everything, right? And you can you look at this URL, right? And then that looking at a, that URL, this gives you the this gives you that basically you can build the index of valid sites. And that's these are the kinds of strategies that I tend to use. I tend to not uh, I'm not saying that there's never been a case where you really need to start guessing, but usually there's a way that you can find to not guess. Yeah, so it looks here like what you're having to do are sort of two orders of scraping or more. Exactly, uh, yeah. And that's pretty common once you get, and this is a more complicated site that doesn't, that is using the post methods of requests and not the method that the other site has. Right, second question I had is that th th this data is basically rectangular, um, but there are 
many situations in which you would imagine that the data would be, uh, the relevant data for us would be non-rectangular. Uh, I hear Python supposed to be good for this. Uh, I know that C would be terrible. Um, rectangular Python, you mean like easily represented in a single table? Yeah, I suppose we wanted to ask, uh, how many children do I, uh, what's my children's ages? You could find out how well, four of mine. How many children do you have? Right. And uh, you could have a, you'd have a null set. Um, yeah. So I mean, here's the thing is, like, basically this is what, um, 90% at least, maybe even more, 90% of what happens when we use a website is, is that there is some database that's got a bunch of tables. And then, uh, like here's us, right? All right. And we're like, we want to look at a web, we want to look at a, a website. And we're like, at like, slash example page. And then there's, you know, a web server. And that goes to that. And then it, you know, does some, and it makes a call to the database, right? And then, like, calculates it all on the fly, and then sends it, and then sends it, the, and then sends it back to life. And so what kind of web scraping is, is an API to that database that's really awkward, right? You know, I mean, like, so like most of the time that like when, most of the time what you're doing with it when you're writing a database scraper is you're just trying to replicate this database over here through the website, and so uh, on the on the scraper that I have, which if, you know, if you're interested you can look at, I'll, I'm documenting it more right now. Uh, uh, let's start scraping. There's like, I'm like uh, instead of writing into a CSV file, I'm writing into an SQL database. And I'm writing like three or four tables as I'm building this up. So, quick comment. I mean, I, I think we partially ran into this non rectangular problem here when DuPage County, Chicago didn't have all the, as many fields, you know, and we just ended up putting nothing in there. Like but but anyway, um, uh, can you comment on going from so like on the ledges star for example, you had several pages of results. Can you comment on the going page to page to page? Yeah. Um, well, so let me show you how we do that here. Uh, Okay, so this is, this is we're parsing the search results here, and we have, uh, there is a, uh, this is a, this is not a link, this is actually a Java, so what happens when you click that, what happens on this site, when you click uh, one of these, is, is that uh, you see this thing where it says JavaScript do post back, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there, so there's, uh, this is not a link, this is actually not even a submit thing, there's like a little bit, there's, this, there's, a, there's a piece of JavaScript on this page that's kind of listening for uh, oh, the f called do postback that's listening for values. And when it gets that value, then it creates a request dynamically and sends it to the website server. And so what we're, we can do all of that. We, like, we, we can, be, we can re we're basically re recreating the functionality of this JavaScript uh, in Python. So first of all, we find that little value. See the CTL content placeholder, blah, blah, blah. See how that is exactly, looks, if this thing was expanded out, it looked exactly like that. Um, and then we're grabbing all of that. And then we're saying, um, yeah, and then we're saying, what are we saying here? Uh, yeah, and then we're going, and then we're gonna, we're gonna step through uh, each of those yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna step through each of those all the way through, right? <coughs> and so we need to do this. We have to we have to be sending. Let's go. This a little strange. So basically, yeah, we do. What we what I did there is I looked through like at Firebug and like 
traced back the request, and then I just said, okay, well, I can just re I can just manually set that and and make and make that and make that request myself. And so the request was intelligible enough to where you could figure out where the one digit is that is the page number or whatever that. Well, the thing is, is that like it. it I mean, intelligible enough is kind of <laughs> it's like I was committed to doing it, right? Like it, like this, this one took like this. Figuring out, like, re basically reverse engineering how this website worked took a few days, you know. I mean, and like, you have to, and this is why it's really usually pretty good idea to be really clear about whether the data is worth it, because a lot of websites it can take a long time to understand exactly how it's working. But yes, in fact, it is always the case that you that uh, that you should be able to figure out what is happening. It may be hard; they may make it difficult. But the thing is, is that uh, the browser doesn't have any capacity that you don't have. Like, yeah, it's, it doesn't know, it doesn't have any secrets that you can't automatic, that you can't, you can't emulate. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and I, I have a question. Uh, uh, what should I do if I want to collect, uh, I mean, a dynamic process? Uh, like, like what? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, something like uh, BBS, and uh, uh, there is uh, one topic, and many people uh, interacting with each other. Uh -huh. and, uh, so uh, what should I do if, uh, uh, if I want to collect this data? Well, so then you, I mean, so, okay, so you got, you got something that's changing, and you want to be able to track the changes over time? Yes, yeah. I, mean, I mean, the data is uh, binomial or multinomial, so agree uh, and disagree or neutral. So, how, how can I uh, collect uh, this, this data? Well, I, I, I thought I answered your question, but now I don't. Um, so, I mean, what does it have to do with, so like either, is it a temporal, is your, is your question like, I want to be able to know how something's changing over time? Is that your question? Uh, 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 yeah, I, mean, uh, I mean, how can I collect data of uh, each people, of each people says? Uh, right, so that's, then you, what you do is you just, Check frequently. No, I, I mean the, the, the data, some like uh, text, uh, small text. So how can I uh, transfer small text to uh, s a number of values? Oh, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, in, how do you uh, well, that's a coding problem. Sentiment. Line. Sentiment. Is that what you're saying? Ah, that's an excellent question. We'll come back next week. That's what, that's what the topic is going <laughs> to be. <laughs> Uh, what do you recommend for dealing with your regular text characters, uh, like an ampersand or um, um, characters in foreign languages, like an E with an umlaut? Well, one of the really beautiful things about Beautiful Soup is that it's natively Unicode, so you usually don't have to do too much. That's uh, Beautiful Soup is a very wonderful library. That's one of its great strengths is, is that it can handle uh, it can it can handle larger character sets uh, very, very kind of naturally. Including ideographic ones? What's that? Including uh, ideographic ones? Yep. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, the, no, it's, 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 it can do the whole, you know, it doesn't have any problem with Unicode. No, but there's oftentimes, so Unicode is like the, the kind of large, large set of, of character encodings and ideograph, most ideographic stuff I think is in Unicode. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I wouldn't, I would say complete guarantee, but that's kind of what the idea of Unicode is, is that it's the uh, one encoding for, to, for the ball. So, if your data is not stored in HTML, like, for, uh, well, I was thinking of a specific example where, like, um, there's like a database of PDF files or something, and I want information that's in each PDF. Is there, you know, is there some way to, to approach that? Yeah, there are. So, I mean, it really depends. So, like, basically what we're kind of starting to talk about is, a, is it was about semi-structured data, right? You know, is, is that, like, the reason why we're able to pull out uh, the data from this website is because even though it's kind of awkward, it's the same, it's organized the same way on each page. And that can also be true of PDFs. Actually, if, like, PDFs, when you look at them the right way, Look just like, um, look just like HTML. That's a bunch of tags, and a bunch of text. 
Uh, and the tags, there's a bunch more tags because it's like because they actually like placed this thing at this x y coordinate. Um, but in principle, particularly if the particularly if it's not as if it's a scan of an image, then you're then you're then you're you're in rougher shape. But if it's actually something that was created not that way, it created like as an output of like say an HTML doc of a, like a Word document, then there are some good tools. Uh, one that I'm beginning to look at a little bit is called PDF Miner. Um, that is not as not super easy to use, but it's basically this exact thing. Right? There's like if the PDF has a consistent format across, then 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 this approach is then you should be able to extract the information that you want. In that case, you would write some script to download all the PDFs and then run them for this. Exactly. To extract that. So I mean, but oftentimes, I mean, it depends upon what you want to do. The other, I would also think about like you know, it might be sufficient depending on what you're doing to just uh, um, to OCR the PDFs and just just like see if certain strings exist in the text. You know, I mean, in that way. You, you throw away the structured information, but it can oftentimes be easier than trying to actually uh, understand how this PDF is organized. Because PDFs are, the PDF specification is like much uglier than HTML. Sorry, can you say what you mean by OCR? Oh, uh, optical character recognition. So, the, so actually, for most of the case, if like the PDF was made by like say exporting it from Word, it already is, it already has an encoding of all the text in it, uh, but. Um, if it's a scan of a document, then it can just like it's just a picture, right? It doesn't know that like it's text. And then there's a technology called optical character recognition. And actually, um, uh, uh, Acrobat Reader Pro, which is on the library computers here, has it built in, and it will say like it will try to take an image of of an image of text and try to figure out what the and figure and try to ex try to figure out what the text is. And uh, it's something that like I would just like and actually the one there are better ones, but the ones for um, the ones the the OCR that's in uh, an Acrobat Reader Pro, which is on which is everyone can use here, is actually pretty good. And I would might go that way. Yeah. So, if anyone has any questions, or if you want to, you dig into the dig into the code a little bit more, and you need help understanding what's what's going on with it, then you can always get in touch with me. I'd be happy to and have help you out. Have you circulated, or will we circulate the little intro that you developed? Yeah, I'll put a we'll put a link to that on the on the website.